Welcome, my name is Jelani Cobb. I am a historian and a professor of journalism at Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism uh, and a staff writer for The New Yorker. I have the honor of talking today to Hannibal Johnson, uh, who is also a historian who has done remarkable work, really cornerstone work uh, about an event which we are all uh, concerned with, particularly at this moment, uh, and that is the anniversary of the uh, historical attacks uh, and the massacre that occurred in the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. Uh, and uh, his most recent book is Black Wall Street 100, An American City Grapples with Its Historical Racial Trauma. Uh, and so, uh, Mr. Johnson, it's really an honor to talk with you today and welcome. It's great to be here. So uh, I'll start with the kind of most important part here, which is, you know, bookshelf envy. Uh, I can see uh, you have an extensive uh, collection of work uh, back there behind you and uh, manuscripts and documents and uh, copier. And uh, for me, uh, that is all kind of a badge of the work that you're doing. And so uh, one of the first things that I want to talk about is how you've gone about doing this work and how you have gone about uh, restoring uh, the history, that fateful history of Tulsa and uh, Greenwood and what happened a century ago uh, this week. Uh, and it, what were the obstacles to researching to, to the work that you've been doing? I got into this in, in, in some ways by accident. I'm a lawyer by profession. And I moved to Tulsa in the mid 1980s. I actually grew up in Fort Smith, Arkansas, which is about 100 miles southeast of Tulsa. But I wasn't really familiar with Tulsa. So when I moved here, worked for the law firm, I became engaged in the community. And one of the things that I was asked to do was write a regular guest editorial column for the black newspaper, the Oklahoma Eagle, which I did. And at one point, I was assigned to do a series on the history of the Greenwood District, the African American community. I did that, became really interested in that history in both the economic and entrepreneurial prowess of members of the community early on, and of course the devastation um, that befell the community in, in 1921, but the remarkable resilience and the rebounding and resurrection post-1921. So I ended up writing a book called Black Wall Street from Riot to Renaissance in Tulsa's Historic Greenwood District back in 1998. And at that point, this history was beginning to become um, more in, in bigger in the public consciousness for, for a number of reasons. The most prominent of those reasons was that there was a commission convened by the state legislature at the instance of a black representative, Don Ross, and a black state senator, Maxine Horner. And the commission was called the Oklahoma Commission to study the Tulsa race right of 1921. It met from 1997 to 2001. And it got international attention, both because it looked back and found facts with regard to a historical racial trauma, and because it made recommendations with regard to reparations for that trauma. And so since then, uh, it, this history has been elevated in the public consciousness and awareness. It's been incorporated to some extent in curricula. It, there are many books that have been written about this history, certainly magazine articles, the prominent newspapers, including the New York Times, have, have done many, many stories about this history. So there's not much at this point that is um, difficult to discern, although all the historical questions have been answered. The sources generally are there. There's only one thing that I can think of that is missing. There was an editorial, supposedly, according to some really credible eyewitnesses like B.C. Franklin, the father of eminent historian Dr. John F. Franklin. Mm -hmm. There was an article that appeared in an edition of the Tulsa Tribune, which was a daily afternoon newspaper that no longer exists. But it was an incitement to lynching. And several people say that they saw the article but it's nowhere to be found. And even the archived copy of the paper from that day, whoever the archivist was, cut out the what cut out something that may have been that article. Wow. So it's it's sort of a mystery. But but really what is not a mystery 
is the thinking of the ownership and the editorial leadership of that newspaper. Because that same newspaper, three days after the, the massacre, published an editorial entitled, It Must Not Be Again. Such a district as the old nigger town must never be allowed in Tulsa again. It was a cesspool of iniquity and corruption. That's the same newspaper. So we don't need, wow. to, we don't need to know what that newspaper was thinking. They told us what they were thinking. Wow, that's astounding. Uh, and so I think if we can kind of step back for a minute and talk a little bit about what Greenwood was and how this district came about, uh, you know, where this population had come from and how Tulsa uh, came to have this uh, thriving, uh, bustling uh, Black Wall Street, uh, as uh, you aptly have used in your title. Um, how did this come about? Who were these people? So let's take a step back even further and talk about how did Black folks get to Oklahoma, what is now Oklahoma in the first instance. One of the things that we don't know generally, I'm using we in kind of a universal sense, uh, our history is, is sanitized. And I think we, we can agree on that. Mm -hmm. And so we, most people don't know that the five civilized tribes, the tribes that were forced out of the Southeastern United States into what was then Oklahoma territory in the 1830s and 1840s, the Cherokees, the Muscogee Creeks, the Choctaws, the Chickasaws, and the Seminoles, all those ch tribes engaged in the practice of chattel slavery. Mm -hmm. So they had they had enslaved mm -hmm. black persons living among them on those trails of tears. Mm -hmm. it's important to remember, it, and it's, it's significant for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that the five tribes officially sided with the Confederacy during the Civil War. After the Civil War, that those same tribes executed treaties with the federal government. All but one of those tribes incorporated within those treaties provisions that gave tribal membership to formerly enslaved persons. That would become significant later on in the 19th century, early 20th century, when the Dawes Commission was assembled and when the land allotment process occurred. So a lot of these black folks who lived among the tribes received land allotments. Mm. Other black folks after the Civil War didn't get the 40 acres and a mule, but, but these folks who were members of the tribes based on those treaties got, got land allotments. And land, of course, is particularly during the late 19th century, early 20th century, land is an accession to wealth. So that land is really significant in terms of the creation of successful economic communities like the Greenwood District in Tulsa. So the person who's credited with founding the Greenwood District is a man named O.W. Gurley. He was a wealthy businessman from Arkansas who came to Oklahoma in one of the land runs in 1889. He migrated to Tulsa, um, purchased some land. He had a great relationship and partnership with um, J.B. Stratford, who was a lawyer, owned a hotel, reportedly the most glamorous boutique African-American hotel in America at the time. Hmm. These men really cultivated what was what would become, in Booker T. Washington's words, uh, the Negro Wall Street of America that later morphed into Black Wall Street. Now, Black Wall Street, in my estimation, is really a misnomer. This was much more of a black main street because mm -hmm. it wasn't a banking and investment capital. It was a concentration of small businesses, mom and pop type operations, movie theaters, dance halls, pool halls, grocery stores, restaurants, jitney services, um, haberdasheries, beauty parlors, barber shops, confectionaries, all manner of small businesses coupled with professionals, doctors, lawyers, Dent dentists, accountants. So it was a concentration of black economic prowess in a segregated community, literally just north of the Frisco tracks from downtown Tulsa. Mm -hmm. These folks face what I consider to be an economic detour in that when they approach the gates of economic opportunity dominated by white business leaders, they were turned away. And what they did was, using their resourcefulness, create a black economic oasis in the Greenwood district. And the dollars were in many ways legally constrained within that district. Even the people who worked outside the district 
in, for example, if you were a domestic in a white home and you're black female, you might go out and work for these the, the, the white family, but you bring your money back home and you get your hair done and you go to the movies and you buy groceries and you go to a dance hall on Saturday night. So the dollars circulated and recirculated in the confines of the community. That's significant. Um, decades later, we find that integration is really a death knell for the successful black economic community that was the Greenwood District because it allowed dollars to flow outside the community and undermine the financial foundation that had kept the community afloat. Mm. So if we think about this in, in the context of history, uh, you know, 15 years before Greenwood, uh, there's a race riot in Atlanta right. where uh, spurred on uh, by uh, uh, spurious uh, rumors of uh, a crime wave, a white mob begins attacking black people, uh, presumably or purportedly uh, seeking revenge, uh, but also specifically attacking uh, the Peachtree District area where there are a significant number of prosperous black businesses. Um, if we go back uh, even earlier than that, you know, a, a decade and, a, and some years before, Ida B. Wells, the crusading journalist. Memphis. Uh, yeah, yeah, Memphis, uh, yeah. gets her start in journalism when she's reporting on the lynching of three of her friends. And she says that uh, they are murdered for the crime of operating a successful business. Uh, and so we're setting the moment of, in the context of what happens in 1921. Uh, where is this community uh, in relationship to the white community of Tulsa and you know, on the verge of these attacks in May of 1921? Where, what are the standings? What are the dynamics there? So Tulsa in many ways is emblematic of the racial violence that was endemic in the United States during the, this period. And I think contextualizing is really, really important. And it, it's set apart really only because of the magnitude of the devastation. It was a highly developed economic community with lots of businesses, lots of wealth, and that was destroyed. But the act of its destruction is nothing new, unique, or novel. I mean, it, it really is an evolution, part of which is a couple of years before the 1919 so-called race riots. Summer and fall of 1919, red summer, more than two dozen major race riots all over the country, um, red metaphorical reference for blood spilled in the streets. It's, it's, it's part of that. Mm -hmm. And simultaneously or contemporaneously, lynching is, is going on in America. So I describe lynching really as domestic terrorism. The whole point mm -hmm. is not simply to punish the, the individual target or targets, but rather the greater point is to reinforce white supremacy, to keep black people in their place and to, and to put them um, in fear and anxiety of the consequences of stepping outside their bounds. So one of the dynamics that's going on in Tulsa and in elsewhere I like to use the psychological phrase, cognitive dissonance. Mm. So white supremacy is the operative mindset in terms of the racial pecking order. And if you have a white community like in Tulsa, in which some white folks are not faring particularly well, and they can quite literally stand on the Frisco railroad tracks and look to their north and see those people living in homes that they own, driving cars, wearing fancy clothes, going out to dinner, going to dance halls and so forth, it causes cognitive dissonance. That is a misalignment between what one believes ought to be true and what is true on the ground. That's so the world is upside down. A, 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 exactly. And so so to, to, to align those things, one might resort to violence and specifically to bringing the black community down a peg so it's it's now aligned with these lower white folks. Hmm. That certainly was a dynamic going on in Tulsa. And Tulsa, uh, of course, had 
a significant clan presence beginning in the early 1920s and throughout the, the, the whole decade. Both Tulsa and Oklahoma had a huge uh, clan presence ultimately. Hmm. That, that's a factor uh, in terms of the disturbance here. Uh, so, so, so walk us through, uh, you know, the, the incident that sparks this and uh, the onset of the violence that ultimately engulfs Greenwood. So the, the incident that people are aware of is an elevator incident between two teenagers. But, but I always footnote that by saying the underlying causes of the riot were much more complex. Uh, the elevator incident didn't cause the riot or the massacre. Um, it was these other factors, the national context of racism, uh, this cognitive dissonance that I talked about, land lust, the fact that the railroads and other people wanted the land, they wanted to move the black community farther north and use the land for higher and better purposes, They so they said. The Klan presence, as I've already talked about, and then the media, particularly these um, newspapers, and mo more specifically, the Tulsa Tribune, which was a daily afternoon newspaper. So Tulsa was a tinderbox or a powder keg, needing only a catalyst or an igniter, a trigger event. That trigger event was the incident in the elevator involving two teenagers. It began on Monday, May 30th, 1921, which is Memorial Day. Dick Rowland, 19-year-old black boy, shine shoes to make extra money. Tulsa was on its way to becoming the oil capital of the world. There were a lot of wealthy oil men here, lots of great tips. He needed to use the restroom that particular day. Restroom facilities were segregated. He knew that there was a facility available for his use in a downtown building called the Drexel Building, but it was on the third floor. Elevators back then were manually operated. Sarah Page, a 17-year-old white girl, was operating the elevator that day. Dick Rowland boarded the elevator. Something happened. We don't know exactly what happened, but it's likely that the elevator jerked or lurched. He bumped into her, brushed up against her, perhaps stepped on her foot. She began to scream. She overreacted. The elevator landed back in the lobby. Dick Rowland, frightened from her screams, ran from the elevator. Sarah Page exited the elevator. She was comforted by a locally owned store clerk who's who worked for uh, a business named Renberg's. Uh, she told him her story of being assaulted on the elevator. He was concerned as well. He might be concerned if he really believed her, her story. So he called the police. Sarah Page would ultimately recant the original version of the story. She refused to cooperate with the prosecutors who were who had arrested Dick Rowland and we're going to charge him with the assault. So that might have been the end of the story since she wasn't going to cooperate. But the Tulsa Tribune, that daily afternoon newspaper that I mentioned earlier, reported the incident the next day. They captioned the article, Nab Negro for attacking girl in an elevator. It was a false narrative. It was a tale of an attempted rape in broad daylight in a public building in downtown Tulsa. It was a tale of violation of that ultimate racial taboo, black male, white female encounter. The Tribune article also went out of its way to make Sarah Page, the white girl, look more virtuous. And as a corollary, made Dick Rowland, the black boy, look more villainous. And the article had its desired effect. It really stirred up or fomented hostility in the white community against the black community. Again, Dick Rowland was arrested. The boy was arrested, put in jail. The jail sat atop the courthouse. A large white mob began to gather on the lawn of the courthouse, numbering ultimately in the thousands. There was lynch talk, rumors that Dick Rowland was going to be seized from the jail and lynched. Black men were concerned. So several dozen black men, some of them World War I veterans, many of them having weapons, marched down to the courthouse to protect Dick Rowland. Not surprisingly, words were exchanged between the much larger white group and the smaller black group. A white man tried to forcibly take a gun from a black man, the gun discharged. 
And in the words of a riot or massacre survivor, all hell broke loose after that. Black men actually put up a vigorous, albeit short-lived, defense of the Greenwood community initially, but they were outgunned, outnumbered, and overmatched. The white mob spilled over into the Greenwood community, burning, looting, shooting, destroying virtually everything in sight. Many people in the white mob had been deputized by local law enforcement. The white mob forcibly prevented the Tulsa Fire Department from putting out the fires and keeping them from spreading. The violence lasted roughly 16 hours and was quelled by a unit of the National Guard sent in from Oklahoma City, which is about 100 miles west of Tulsa. When the dust settled, most historians and folks who have studied this believe somewhere between 100 and 300 people were killed. The official death toll is 37. 25 black and 12 white. Nobody believes that to be seriously the case because, you know, we know that it, so some people were injured and left town and died from their injuries elsewhere. Record keeping was poor. Some people were summarily buried by family and other, other folks in the community. And then there are lingering, um, possibilities of mass graves and that the mass grave possibility is being investigated even as we speak. Hundreds more people were injured. At least 1,250 homes in the black community were destroyed as were scores of businesses and commercial properties. Many black folks were rounded up and taken to internment centers throughout the city. Very much like people of Japanese ancestry were interned during World War II. Property damage conservatively estimated at the time ranged from $1.5 to $2 million. And that's almost certainly uh, only a fraction of the losses. But even if we assume that to be true, that amounts to well over $25 million in today's money. Mm -hmm. And, and prob it's probably some multiple of that. Mm -hmm. The Red Cross provided the post-massacre relief effort, health care, food, shelter, clothing. By all accounts, did a yeoman's job. Everybody, black and white, uh, declared the Red Cross angels of mercy for what they did. And there were a couple of historic white churches that are still here downtown, First Presbyterian Church and Holy Family Cathedral, that uh, provided substantial post-massacre relief as well. But the real story here is not the massacre, not the devastation, not the hatred. It really is the resilience of the black community. It's the indomitable human spirit exemplified by the people who populated the Greenwood community and who rebuilt, even as the embers from the massacre still smoldered, they were about the business of resurrecting and rebuilding. And in fact, four years later in 1925, this community hosted the national meeting of the National Negro Business League, Booker T. Washington's mm -hmm. Black Chamber of mm -hmm. Commerce. That's astounding. Um, can you talk a little bit about the erasure of this, that there's this tremendous cataclysm that happens, this racial pogrom in the United States among many, but within a few years, scarcely, it's almost as if it hasn't happened. And a generation later, the people who haven't even heard of it and think that this is mythology. How did this erasure take place? It's complicated, like most things. I, I think it is really the confluence of a number of psychological dynamics. When the massacre occurred in 1921, Tulsa was on an upward trajectory, becoming the self-described oil capital of the world. So the white city fathers were interested in people perceiving Tulsa as a cosmopolitan city. Um, and this taint on the reputation of the city couldn't be abided. So it was in their interest to minimize this event. In some sectors of the Tulsa community, the white community, there was shame. People had a difficult time confronting the fact that they allowed this to happen on their watch and in their space. So they just didn't want to deal with that shame. In the black community, there was post-traumatic stress disorder. It was anxiety and fear, fear that something like this could recur 
if they weren't careful. After all, we think about it, two years later, there was a massacre in Rosewood, Florida, 1923. Anxiety. Some of the survivors and the, and the families connected to the massacre talk about, you know, we didn't really want to burden our children with the horrors of the massacre. So we just kept quiet about it and went on about their business. We didn't want to stunt their growth and development. Hmm. So all these factors, it's, it's the confluence of these things that allowed this to go, in legal parlance, we'd say sub rosa, beneath the surface, swept under the carpet, right? And so because the people who were in, in power to shape and mold the curriculum chose not to put it in textbooks. How do, how, do we, how do we share information across generations? Well, that's part of the function of the public schools and the curriculum that we choose to embed in our public schools. And if this is not part of the curriculum, then it's not surprising that many people, even people who grew up here over the decades, were largely ignorant of this history. And that's sort of how it all happened. I wanna talk briefly, if I could, about three openings in awareness or public consciousness. So in 1971, a white gentleman na named Ed Wheeler published an article about the massacre, then called the riot, um, in a black magazine. It's 1971, the 50th anniversary of the massacre. He received death threats. He still, he's, he still lives in Tulsa. He's in his 80s and he was interviewed about a month ago. And he said, you know, I was downtown one day after the article published and, and somebody tapped me on the shoulders like a stranger and said, you know, you shouldn't be talking about this stuff. Just walked away. And mm -hmm. so he received death threats. He actually moved his family out of the house temporarily during this period. 1971. 1982, Dr. Scott Ellsworth, who grew up in Tulsa, a white gentleman who is a professor of history at the University of Michigan, wrote his dissertation under the tutelage of Dr. John Hope Franklin at Duke and he, cra he really sort of recast that as a book called Death in a Promised Land. It's mm. probably the seminal book that's focused on the massacre itself. And this was 1982, and it, it really elevated the, the level of awareness of this history to some extent. But the big opening came in 1997 and then through 2001 when the Oklahoma Commission to study the Tulsa race right of 1921 was meeting, they had public meetings. Dr. John F. Franklin was honorary chair of the commission. They held hearings, they interviewed and cataloged the interviews of survivors and issued a report in February of 2001 that got international attention. And so that was, that was sort of the grand opening to this history and knowledge. And things like curriculum began to change now, Tulsa Public Schools is in the process and may have just completed uh, an effort to infuse this history into the curriculum for all grades K through 12 at age appropriate levels in a multidisciplinary way. So I hope that Tulsa Public Schools has done such a great job that it will be a model for other communities that are struggling with historical racial trauma across the nation. Mm. That would be that would be one beneficial outcome of, of all this suffering. Uh, there's one other thing that I want to talk about uh, while we have time. I watched uh, Viola Fletcher, uh, who is 107 years old, uh, give her testimony before Congress about witnessing uh, the massacre, the attack on Greenwood in 1921. And the thing that occurred to me was this. Uh, it's astounding to consider witnessing a calamity of this scale and then looking at your seven-year-old daughter and thinking she has to remember everything she sees for 100 years in order to be able to tell Congress about it. The burden of that responsibility is astonishing to me. I wonder where things stand in terms of attempts to set this right, reparations, uh, what has been done as a gesture, given that many of the people who, who committed these acts were deputized, uh, 
and thereby acting on the authority of the state itself. What has been done in, in terms of recompense? Okay. So for, for when I talk about reparations, I, have, I start from the beginning, which is with definitions. So reparations for me means to make amends or to repair the damage. Reparation it, it really relates to a bundle of possibilities. So one possibility is monetary reparations for identified individuals. These would be survivors or descendants. Um, there, there are different routes to monetary reparations for survivors and descendants of an incident like this. The legal route is perhaps the most unlikely and most treacherous. A lawsuit was filed on behalf of survivors and descendants back in 2003. Charles Ogletree at Harvard led it. Um, it was ruled to be time barred by the courts. The statute of limitations said the suit should have been, been brought within a specified period it's too late, witnesses have died, people, you know, memories have faded. That's the theory behind statute of limitation. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's literally a um, facially neutral provision. I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with race, but as, as a practical matter, the statute of limitations in a case like this does have something to do with race because if they had brought the suit back in, 1921 or two or three or four or 35 or whenever, they wouldn't have had any chance of success on, on the merit. So we have to sort of ignore that to, to buy the statute of limitations barrier. But that but but that that was the barrier back in 2003. There's another lawsuit that's been filed on a different legal theory that doesn't, uh, doesn't implicate the statute of limitations. We'll see where that goes. I think the legal avenue is not it's not the most likely avenue. The reparations that, cash reparations that we know that have been accorded to people related to similar kinds of events have come through the legislative process. For example, the Rosewood massacre survivors received reparations from the Florida legislature, not through the courts. Japanese internees from World War II received reparations from Congress, not through the federal courts. So I think strategy is really important. That said, there's no question, certainly not for me, and I, I doubt if there's for you either, in terms of, of the moral appropriateness of caste reparations. But what I like to, to, to emphasize to people is, yes, that, that's one avenue of reparations, but there are many more, and we ought to look at all of them, and we ought to be doing all of them simultaneously. So there are reparations that are investments in education and economic welfare. Um, changing the curriculum is a form of reparations. If, if, if reparations means to repair damage and to make amends, I can't think of a better avenue than changing the curriculum so that the knowledge base is expanded and so that we don't repeat the same mistakes over and over out of our ignorance. Curriculum is a big deal, investments in education could include scholarships and all sorts of other stuff. Investments in the black community specifically, economic stimulus type investments targeted to the black community would be a form of reparations. There are other forms of reparations that are investments in public spaces. Like we are building right now a world-class history center that opens up on June the uh, 3rd, June the 2nd, June the 2nd. And that to me is part of the reparations piece. It doesn't address, however, culpability. So when we talk about cash reparations, we're generally talking about reparations from these government entities, the city and the state that are culpable in the wrongdoing that caused or precipitated the event. And so, while these other kinds of reparations can be embraced by philanthropists and uh, corporate folk and all that, all these things need to be done simultaneously. Um, they're not mutually exclusive. And to have true reconciliation, to, to truly get as close as we can to making amends or repairing the damage, we've got to operate really on all cylinders. Hmm. You know, uh, Mr. Johnson, we could talk about this uh, for another hour. Uh, we're right up against our time limit. Uh, and so I just want to say thank you uh, 
uh, for doing this work. Uh, thank you for being a voice and a beacon uh, and a witness. Uh, we need, unfortunately, more people like you because there are many more stories like this that need to be told. Uh, but thank you for telling this one. Absolutely. Thank you.